you know, I think that's the other politicized factor of our house that I will talk about is that it's not treated well on the radio in New York. It's like, you know, they diss it. House is gay. And I got love for many gay people. I'm not saying it's house is house. How about that? Today is Friday, December 4th, 2020. Who are we speaking with? We're speaking with Ojinga, otherwise known as Phil the Filmmaker, creator of the documentary, The Soulful Sounds of the Underground from Brooklyn, New York. And I would like to say peace and love and thank you very much for enjoying my documentary or my film and participating with me in this way to further along the conversation that maybe there can be some changes in our scene so that we can really flourish and have a, a mark. Let's pick up on that. What changes would you like to see in the scene right now? Uh, I think, you know, in terms of when it was pre-COVID, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lack of, of young influence. And it seems as if there's a, a, a gap when we were young, we, we ran to the clubs or ran for this new sound. And it seems like that sound has kind of dissipated into the air. And young people aren't really that interested. And I, I gamble is to why, because we were, you know, and I, I would think, you know, just like the hip hop generation, it would continue. And I do see it at times, but it's kind of less than I would like. Mm. How'd you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that was about it. How'd you get into house? Ah, it was just, I'm gonna show you two things. This is an on-screen presentation. This is the first tape. It was a tape that my uncle taped at the Paradise Garage. And that was my first intro into what is known as Disco House. And this tape here, Jack Tracks, it was one of the first tapes that I ever bought that was strictly, predominantly Chicago house. And this and that tape led me into what is in here. But I was always into music, so I can't really say these tapes alone gave me that. I, I won a dance contest at seven years old on a block party to Trans Europe Express. And we were doing pre-break dance. I was doing gymnastics, acrobatics, and African dance. And these other kids were palling around with me. They were flipping and doing different things. And the kind of the crowd kind of separated and we won. It was three little kids. It was 1977, date I'll never forget. And it was on Decatur. And we were now Marcus, I mean Malcolm X and Patchen, Reed and Patchen at the time. And uh we broke it down. And that was like when I knew sound, when I first knew sound. Mm -hmm. But if we go further than that, you see with my parents, you know, they were jazz enthusiasts, artists. So that really kind of like molded me, you know, gave me my harness, you know, the solid foundation. Let's let's get into the film and then we'll go on these into these off topics. So the film is called Soulful Sounds of the Underground, a spiritual film. Um, tell people what the film is about. Well, my idea was to promote the beauty of the industry because I had seen so many negative aspects, the drugs, the over sexualization, the gender bender issue, and all of those things kind of like darken the music or darken the industry. And I was like, yo, we gotta come to the light. So that's why I kind of like pulled it out of the club into the Fort Greene era and the outdoor events, which is very popular. And, you know, tried to just manifest the beauty of it all. And even though there are intricacies involved, tell a story about where the music and how it became popular amongst us. 
So that was basically it. Uh, and what was your intention of making making this film? Oh, uh, when I first made it, I was like, I'm gonna make a lot of money, you know. But then I realized to pay for the soundtrack, that was gonna be a lot of money. So, and there wasn't, you know, like all of these new gadgets where you could read music and get the title and get the artist and all of that. It wasn't that at that time. I didn't. I started editing about oh about oh seven. So I was still in the pre-era of all of this recognition, voice recognition, music recognition. So that, in terms of it, was why I didn't really put it on the market. But I, in turn, felt like this is art, and art needs to be seen. And I've gotten some good compliments, and I'm very happy with what I've done. What was your biggest challenge in making the film? Hmm. Gathering, gathering the people. Hmm. First of all, I wasn't a big clip guy. So I had to like find the storyline through people. And sometimes they were very apprehensive about giving me any information. So I would be like, okay, I'm going to have to write my own story. And then even in that, I had to be kind of accurate. But that, that was mostly the main one, like trying to get people involved. There were some people that were enthusiastic and I'm glad I got what I got. I could have gotten more, but you know, the support, that would probably be the most important thing that we, we could talk about, about the industry. It's, it, it's funny because, you know, I'm not an artist in terms of making music yet, yeah. but there is, you know, this whole aspect of the industry that people feel like the other counterparts aren't supporting each other. And I've heard that argument from different people. You know. Interesting. Why do you think people didn't want to share the story with you? Mm. It's interesting about it all. You know, some people don't really know what in warehouse really comes from so and then they interpret it through the whole Chicago scene and I'm not none against them for calling their house or whatever because even shout out to my man boy Jarvis he would say this to me it ain't no damn house it ain't it ain't house it's music and if we we kind of like get through all separations. We could have something that would last and really make an impact. Because I think, especially when you listen to a lot of the soulful tracks, their, their words are so important. And it really, I think in this time of meditation, we need that more. We need a mantra. That's what society, general society, kind of has the mantra of the bad boy image or the gangster image, but we need a soulful mantra that's going to heal. And that's what the whole essence for me is. Why I went to the club, I didn't go for the women. I went for the dancing and the, the release of the energy, get, my, get back to myself. So when I went back to work with the world or the white world or whatever world it was, I can handle my business. That's what House gave me. So I gave back. Who's the audience for this film? Anyone. Anyone and everyone. Love that. And then um, you said that people weren't really helpful in telling, um, sharing the story. So what story did you come up with? What was it? What's, how would you describe the narrative of the film? Well, I was just trying to figure out how it affected people and how it went across the world. So interestingly, and it was, so I felt like, let me just be like a news reporter. You know what I mean? Rather than, yo, house music, yo, you know, like a hype guy. I don't want to be a hype guy. Right. You know, because it's already hyped. 
you know, I think that's like one of my things about this. If you let the music on its own be itself, you will see the, the importance, but you don't need to like, you know, do all of that, you know, it, it does itself. So that's what I was doing. I was just like, let me feel it out rather than, you know, the talking heads with the studio guys and all of that. That's great, but you, you got to get to the people. And that was my main thing. I was like, I want to talk to the people, average people that don't, may know house or don't know house or whatever, you know, like all share into the story, you know, and maybe that could educate some people about what this is truly and, you know, bring them to the crowd. You know what I mean? And then what insights do you have now after having completed the film? Oh man, I, I, I'm glad I did it because, you know, it was magical and uh, if I wish that I would have put uh, more backing, like if I would have got somebody like Louis Vega to finance me <laughs> or something like that, you know, like some big weight, you know, to help me along my path so that, that it would have been like, it would have been more exciting to do. But I enjoyed every minute of it, bro. I mean, I got the history. That, that, that Chicago piece is probably the best part for me. Why is that? Well, it was my first Chicago party ever. And also I got to be the legend. I had seen him at the world and all these clubs in New York in the eighties and the nineties when I came in the scene. But I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't close because there was a barrier back then. You know, the DJ was sanctified. You couldn't go up in the in the booth and all of that shit. No, nah, nah, you, you over there, you know, it was a it was a long crowd before you it was layers. It was layers. They were protected. And that was good because that gave them a sense of respect. Yeah. You know, but I was so fortunate that when I got there, I mean, I always tell the story, but I and I'll tell it to the world here. I did a blind man's bluff and my, my mate at the time asked me, you a filmmaker, you ain't no filmmaker, you ain't going to Chicago. And I was like, oh yeah, go get the camera. And I covered my eyes and I closed them and I pointed to the center and it was August 25th, God bless. I don't know how that happened. She says, oh, that's my father's birthday. And by the way, they throwing a party for Frankie, maybe something. So I grabbed my camera. Mind you, I was working construction. It's a Wednesday. We get on the plane, fly, land, and we land right into Grant Park, basically. And it was like, oh, snap, this is real. And from there, it extended. It was like, I'm at the back. That's when I met um, DJ Whiteout and the little crew right there. And we was chilling. I was all the way in the back. So as you see, I had walked all the way up and got up on the stage and I was kind of curious as to why I didn't get bounced. Cause you know, if that was New York, you know, even Central Park, there was no way I would have ever even got on the stage. Yeah, I got to talk, wish him well from Brother Boyd. Brother Boyd had sent him a message and I just, that was, that was the hardest party that I've ever been at because it was the biggest party up to date that I had been to. And it was in Chicago. I should have been like, you know, jacking. No, but I got this camera on my back. I gotta be careful. I'm trying to film. I gotta, I got, you see how steady that camera was, right? Yeah. That, that, that right there, my dude, I, when I talk about my film, it's steady. Nobody can mess with that. And I did all of that even with the music in my ear and all of this going on and blah, 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 whatever, you know? So you do what you gotta do, you know, you wanna create. And that's what I really wanted to express with my film is that the hard work that goes into creativity is, is, is real. If you wanna create, you gotta do hard work. You can't be no lightweight. So I did, and 
I'm glad for it. And I think it'll rest in history for the people that are in it. Thank you very much. When did you start shooting the film and when did you finish shooting the film? Ooh, that's kind of tricky. I'm going to say Let's say hmm, oh three. Mm -hmm. Oh three to nine. Yeah, it's like seven years. But I had some other information to add in, you know, that from years previous, you know, just like that body and soul piece. That was just a little clip. That was that. I think that was like the beginnings of what I was thinking about. I was like, "Yo, man!" And, it, and you know that body and soul part he was. Oh my God! Off the chain, bro. That 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 was when it was closing, and ooh, you couldn't even walk in there, bro. That mm -hmm. night, you could mm -hmm. not walk. That was club vinyl. That everybody knows. If anybody's listening, they it'd be like this on that one because that club had it going on. And we had a good time that night. So yeah, from that time in 03 to 09, and then I just started slowing down and editing. Uh knowing what you know now, how would you approach this film differently, if at all? More back in. Because, you know, I could have used the, the crew. If you got a crew, you can move through things and make things happen. And it was interesting. The, the thing is, I, if I would have made a different route, it would have been more of a studio piece. Because my brother Phil Maylard over at um, City Center, um, he was, you know, they, they have a studio there. And he was like trying to get me to go into the studio and create like a, a like a real video documentary. And I was like, I was kind of scared of that because it was it, it, it required a certain skill that you know like that Spike Lee shit. And I'm more of a you know kind of running gun guy, so I could do guerrilla tactics you know better than. And I was like, and it would have cost so much. And then I would have again, to get that participation. See, that's what, what I'm talking about. Had I had backing from like the artists in the industry, then they would have had their following come through and be like, yeah, yo, I'm gonna exchange this with you because you know, this is for history, you know? And of course, you, know, you get more information. But I was glad that I was able to line up the story like I did, you know, and just run with it there, you know? Are there any people that you wanted to include in the film that you weren't able to, and why? Maybe they said no, or? My man, Boyd. Boyd Jarvis, God mm -hmm. bless you, bro. We were, we were real tight at that time. And- Well, we let's to... pause right there. Who is Boyd Jarvis for those that don't know? Explain to people like Boyd Jarvis. Uh -oh. Well, a lot of people know who he is in the house world. And it's interesting because, you know, the whole argument is that house came from Chicago, right? So check it. Roy Jarvis was born in Bedford Stuyvesant. And he's one of the pioneers for the New York scene. So he really came from Brooklyn. That's my argument. He came from Best Star. And it's kind of weird because his voice was haunting when I, that tape, this tape has a couple of his tracks on it. And it was like, it was the first song I could remember. Music is the answer, you know, running, stuff like that. You know, like it just kept me going, kept me going. So when I would figure it out that he was that guy, you know, but you know, as his life is, you go through things with people, man. And unfortunately, he was in a, a rough space. 
him, you know? So I had to like let him go. And it's like love, right? If, if, if you let love go and it comes back to you, then it was meant to be. And we had that after the film was made, we came back together before he passed and we continued our relationship. But, you know, I, I would say that he was, he was house. He was quintessentially a great musician, although he wouldn't say that. He said to me personally, he's a, a modulator, a, a sound modulator, excuse me. And that um, in terms of it, he had a lot of technical skill. Like when I first met him, bro, he was reading books this thick about law, about computers, about just like all of the stuff that you would never think of. And that's what really is incorporated in the sound of what we know as house. Is that, that it, it becomes intelligent music. And that he knew, he knew that. I will always like be thankful for the information he gave me because that's, you can't get that. You, you, it, it, it's so compressed in him. And, and at times it would come out wild, you know, like just like any artist, you know, they bug out for him and, you know, they got too much energy. And he was like a cool nerd, you know what I mean? So that was just like the best for me. And I wish he would have been more in the film in a, a verbal aspect, but he has his light, you know, and I'm glad for him, you know, and, and what he's done, which is, you know, like, started it like like his boy straight let's let's set it off they set it off they set it off for us mm -hmm. well said um what surprised you about this project <sighs> access when you start to have like a camera on your back and if you get a press card you get in anywhere. So it was almost like at times, like I, I'll give you a, a great for instance, black coffee, that scene. Bro, I was in the party all night. I'm like, yo, I'm gonna get black coffee. So we get him, we gonna interview this cat tonight. All right? So pull out the camera. And everybody's, this is like at the end of the party, everybody's like at the end of his set. He's like moving around, he's trying to switch over stuff and everything. And I was like, yo, I gotta get this interview. So I see my man and I go, yo, hook me up. And um, Black Coffee was like, who's this guy? Like looking at me like, what's going on here? And my man goes, Ed Dunn, shout out. He's a great uh, producer as well, DJ. He works with uh, Torch So and the like in the Chicago era, Chicago house. Uh, Julius Mad Thinker, yeah, I'm, I'm hollering at you. DJ Freak, I'm hollering at you. You know, all of them cats. So, you know, he was like, yo, he's good. He's good people. And that gave me that answer. So it's like, you know, you got to make it happen, you know, and I did. So that, 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 that's really what really surprised me that people would respond when I would get it in, you know. No, you had really good access, really good access. Yeah, um, I sure did, right? <laughs> uh, you did. And then um, what unique insights do you have about house music after finishing this project? Oh, I'm trying to create some, bro. So, you know, like. It's really weird, you know, I'm a drummer by trade, you know, but I wouldn't say I'm, you know, the drummer, you know, but I do my thing, you know, but um, I'm just like, you know, trying to find the beat myself. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, it, it, what, what's really interesting is that there's so many uh, delivery systems now. Like my man, I got a uh, shout out to my man, Brian Herman who actually did the sound work on that 
and which was impeccable because it was all over the place. And that's another thing. See, when you have money on a film and a budget, you could control more of the things that you have to deal with, like sound. And that's, sound is the most important part of your film. I mean, the shape too, but the sound, if it don't sound good, people gonna run away from your shape. So any filmmakers out there, y'all get your sound good. So my man, Brian hooked me up and you know, so all of that is like what I'm learning about, about house. You know, I even listen to tracks, old tracks, just to break it down. Why did I like this track? What, what, what was the emotion that, and that's the thing, that's the way it really surprised me that you start to learn the emotion of notes. Kia E, Kia Love. Check it. I love you know it. I, mean? I love it. You also did a lot of traveling with this film. I want to go through some of the spaces you went to. Um, let's start from the beginning. Um, what is Ibiza for those that don't know? Well, I mean, if you really want to know, it was the land of the Moors. Like back in the Dizay, that's where the Moors used to play. They had their little shindigs and stuff. And then King Philip, I mean, the second went over there and he took over, he built the castle there. And subsequently, years later, it would become this island of pleasure. And, you know, that castle was really notorious. Like, don't go in there alone, ladies. Be careful out there. If these ain't nothing to play with. It's a great enjoyment. They have a great siesta at three o'clock and everything flourishes in the evening and you can party all night long. Be careful, especially if you're into drugs and thugs. But as I will say, you could play and have a good time. And so that, that's what it really is. It's just like, like uh, clubs, like super clubs, bro. I was in this club, it had an Epcot dome. I couldn't even film it. And I didn't even try to on a bootleg because if they, you know, I mean, they're not gonna come to the States and get me. But like, if they would have caught me on the premises filming, they'd have whooped my ass. But they are very uh, like open. So they had an Epcot dome, like Epcot Center down in uh, Walt Disney. And inside that dome, bro, the, the club was like 10,000 people. And it had like a jungle section over here. That was closed. They had like a waterfall section over here. It was weird, bro. I was like, whoa, this. And I went late in the season because the season starts like June. And then, you know, what they do is they like, okay, during the day, there's nothing really going on. It's just regular life. Then the evening starts creeping. Well, the afternoon is the siesta, right? That's when they take their break. The evening is when they start doing all of that. With the sun. The sun goes down, they clap, right? And then that's when they do all the little parties. And then later on, they have revelers that go through the town, downtown area, and they pick you up. You go to a bus. The bus takes you to the club. And then you'll just party all night and the bus sits there and leaves like every hour or whatever. And then, you know, takes you back to your area. And down there, there's like hostels and stuff like that. So you can, you know, just really have a good time. And it's, they got a little record store there that was really hot. You know, well, it's probably more now. But, you know, a lot of the vendors sell house and you know, although they speak a lot of Spanish there, there's all types of people, you know, it's international, you know, so you really get that flavor in too. Food is good. Women is hot. I mean. Which clubs I mean, did you go to in Ibiza? I mean, Cafe hey, Del, Del Mar was one, right? Say again? Cafe yeah, Del, Cafe Del, Del Mar was one. Yeah. Uh, Privilege. And uh, where else did I go? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, privilege was crazy, bro. I ain't forgot all about that because I didn't even take that. Bro, this club, this club, this club, this club is crazy, bro. Privilege is crazy. When I say super club, got a balcony up there, 
down here is like 20 or even, you know, it, it, it feels like a, it's just like a million people on here, bro. The bathroom is like Grand Central Station thing. It, 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 yo, I said, this is crazy. He was, you know, doing Molly at that time, I think. Some dude had thrown some Molly in the toilet. And this guy, you know, guys went in the toilet and was like, oh, look. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. You know, people get it in with this, you know. I, you know, I, I couldn't mess with that stuff. But um, yeah, man. Oh, they had a a, a deck that looked over the, the the ocean, and that was just like supreme or massive, bro. Like, wow. But yeah, man. You know, they got they got some really. They spent a lot of money out there. You know, like boy, when he went to Greece, they had a um a a, a plane. I think a seven thirty seven got it, and it was a club. So he went up the ladder, and he was in a club, like. Who knew, you know? So anything can be done, but that was in Greece. That was not any reason. Wow. You also shot in Brooklyn. Yeah, that was Fort Green Park a lot, you know? That, that became a little home of mine, you know? And, and and it's quite interesting because, you know, the martyrs is there for the, the people that died. And it's kind of like, you know, a resonance. It's, a, on, a, it's on the top of the hill. I think that's one of the highest hills in, in BK. Gotta yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, all of that. And I'm glad I did it because, you know, I got a lot of flack for that. You know, oh, yo, it's too much for greed in here. All right? So what? Handle it, bro. You know what I mean? I can't. I, 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 first of all, there wasn't too many other sets coming at that time. Mm-mm. You know? And I'm, I'm glad the one in Harlem has picked up, you know? Yeah. yeah. Did you also shoot in Coney Island as well? Uh, I did, but I didn't include it okay. as much. And I had other footage on other tapes that I really... Now, you see, when you say, when did I start? I had an old camcorder. You remember back in the days, the old little camcorders that just came out? And I was trying to tape, and I taped some information from there bro that was that was Pernell when he first started those parties down there Mm -hmm. in the beginnings of Coney Island when it was raw it was still kind of dangerous over there yeah yeah but um I tried to include that but I couldn't find the footage you know and and meld it into the film you know hopefully I find it you also shot in London yeah that was interesting too yeah uh, Piccadilly, that was, um, you know, like it moved around dance culture. So their weekend is, I didn't attend any of that, but I met people that did. And they were, you know, like real cool dudes, you know? So you could see the scene going over there and, and, and being its own. But over there, they, you know, they, Unbeknownst to a lot of people, you think New York and, and the U.S. is racist? You go over there, it's real racism, and it's just that people told a line there. They know, you know, they're not happy about it, they're not acquiescing about it, but you know, it, it's it, it, it's like a, a duality. They know that it's going to happen. They, they're not really trying to crush it. Over here, we like, y'all fight the power, and you know? So, you know, I got into some scuffles over there and stuff like that, especially with black folks. Don't believe that. Shit kind of fucked my head up. But- uh, What happened? Hmm. Is this inevitably jealousy. I was at a, an event. I had gone out with some friends that I met there and they were like, yo, Phil, if you're going out tonight, be careful. I was like, why? He was like, because they only really let one or two blacks into the clubs. I was like, really? This shit is 2000 and, you know, shit. This shit it'd be like that. He was like, yeah. And, I, and as I was walking, I could see like in the bars, it was only like one black guy. And then they would always have, they, they said this about that, that, that they would find a reason to omit you. 
oh, I don't like your shirt or, you know, you, you ain't just smart enough. So I'm standing in front of this club and I don't realize that it's a club because what happens is I just see this beautiful African woman. I'm like, ooh, I'm like, okay. So I'm like, yo, why, why the sisters ain't into the brothers? And she looks at me and goes, I'm into the brothers. And her eye was diverted and I turned to look and it was six more of them. I was like, oh snap, wow, what's going on here? The guy was selling roses, the Arab dudes. They selling roses. We, we, your roses, or something like that. So I'm standing there, and the girl that out of the six, it was one that was like the prima donna. I was like, what's going on with you? She said, like, oh, it's my birthday. I said, oh, it's your birthday? I grabbed the rose. I said, it's her birthday. And they all looked at me like, oh, it's her birthday? I was like, I right. give them all a rose because they're all beautiful. Unbeknownst to me, there was a club over on this side here that had a little slide door. And you could see the velvet rope and the, the bounces and shit. And one had dreads. And all the other ones was like Russians or white, you know, whatever they were. So the girls, like, they start talking and they start going in the club. And the girl, like, the first one that I saw said, come with me. She said, just like that, come with me. I was like, mm -hmm, yeah, let's go in the club. Yeah. I was stupid. Mail, my cheese mo over there trumps everything. The man goes in first. I didn't do that. I waited for them to go. And with all of that chivalry, I'm standing on my horse. <laughs> Dread. Puts the velvet rope. You know now how I feel about the velvet rope. There is no guest list in front of me and says, You ain't coming in here. I said, What? They went into the door and the door shut. Boom. I'm standing out there by myself now. I picked that rope up and threw it at his ass. The whole pylon and everything. Just threw the shit. And boom. Fuck y'all. Now I'm out. Walking. Six of them come at me. Boom. 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 They're trying to pounce me, pounce me. Cops come. They got cameras everywhere. So they saw everything. They saw the interaction. They saw me with the flowers and everything. So the cops is talking to me like, yeah, hey, 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 you good. Get out of here. I get really upset. I'm like, fuck this place. Cop grabs me. Let's go. So I spent the night in the jail there. You know, and that wasn't really. Jail is, yeah. So, but you know, it was one of those experiences. And trust me, let me show you how fortunate I was. I hadn't taken my camera out because I just wanted to experience the clubs. So I left all my equipment out in the hostel. And it's like they got cleaners. When I came back, all my stuff was right there, bro. Every last piece of my equipment, they did not steal nothing and they cleaned that room up nice yeah so wow. you know i had i had it was you know i, I had an experience with this film yeah. um did you also go to south africa or just have some african people in the film no i met them in london what happened was got it so i was walking in this golden state park or something like that and like golden to, you know by youtube but up there they got a golden park and i was walking and how did I meet them? I don't see that was interesting because that brother that's from Chicago, that's in between them two, he was kind of like floundering around too. And we all kind of like met and we was just kicking it about house. And I, he was really interesting because I, I I knew of Ron Hardy, but I didn't really know him until I, I had to investigate him more, you know. Because I wasn't really into the Chicago scene as mm -hmm. much. You know? mm -hmm. But, man, Ron, he's a master too. Uh, you also shot in Amsterdam. Interesting place. Very friendly. Actually, I'll give you that. I meet two twins on the train. They were all born on my birthday. We all born on 9-11 off of a 
a, almost a fatality. I was standing in the train, I put the bag on, and the train rocked, and I hit the glass like this. So everybody's trying to pick me up. And this girl goes, what are you here for? And I had noticed them earlier because they got on in Rotterdam, I think, and they had their finger socks on. And I noticed them automatically. So now she's talking to me. I was like, I'm here to shoot a documentary. Because she asked me if I was here for holiday. I said, no, I'm here to shoot a documentary. She said, oh, you need to stick with me. I said, really? Okay. So we were about to get off. And when we get off, a Russian couple just like bum rushed him. Happy birthday, Luta and her sister. So Luta, I said, when was your birthday? And she goes, September 11th. I go, that's my birthday too. So it was kind of weird. And then from there, it snowballed into the clubs. She she let me stay at the place for the night. That's what I'm talking about, friendly people, bro. You talking about access? Like, bro, I don't even know how I even did it. And it was magic, magic. They got me in the club. That Those people over there, they, they have a certain sensibility for music, bro. Like, I think they that was the first time I was seeing they, they sold the records in the plastic, you know, like a record in plastic sealed, you know, and you won't be messing this up, you know. So that was when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, these people really respect music. So Wicked Jazz, Phil Ornaman, shout out. He's still doing it too. If y'all ever want to get a good set, man, like that's what I do too, is like, kind of go re haunting my film. You know, like if I want to travel, I just go there to their website, listen to what they're doing. They still have fairs out there, music fairs and stuff like that. So do you remember do you do you remember which parties you went to? Well that was really the only one that I had gone to because again I was there late in the season. In the European it because the seasonal like for us, we're going to winter, you know, snowing and everything, right? But up there, they kind of like do it in the summer. Summer's their biggest party because, you know, like, and that's what he was saying in the film, like it doesn't really, you know, the sun doesn't really come out that much out there. Mm-hmm. So when it's summer, they enjoy that shit, you know? So, but yeah, Amsterdam, beautiful place. And like, I would say, why I went there, I was trying to ascertain how did, you know, like, I didn't really realize that it was, New York was part of that, you know, I wasn't really associating Amsterdam with New York at that time. You know, I ever had to do some history reading to really get my my Amsterdam on, you know, realize what how we are Dutch. That's the other thing is like, we kind of grew up in their shadow, you know, culturally with this New York experience. So, you know, I was like kind of impressed. Oh, I'll give you one great uh, piece of the trip that would never be seen. It was a shop. They did like uh, trinkets and sculptures and stuff. And I would always walk by it because they had a bust of a black man in the front window and for me that was just so and it was beautiful bro i mean you know blacker than black ebony black hair black face lips black and i walked into there one day i was like miss i just want to commend you for having this peace in your store i was like i feel like i can move here and you know what she said to me come Please come, you're welcome here. And that was really strange. Me, black man, I ain't white. I ain't white. And they was like, yo, bring it. And I think because they're so industrious, you know, they they wanna make a buck, you know? So if you got some talent, bring it, you know? And that's what I, when I left that trip, what I realized is that the world is waiting for us. Our experience, our passion, 
our culture, like hip hop, like house, they cousins, and the world wanna see us. Um, in making this film, was this your first time traveling internationally? Yes. Mm -hmm. I had, I had never. I should have went to Africa. To tell you the truth, exactly. I mean, I bet you right now, Mozambique, there's something going on. You know, they, and because, you know, once they get into the electronics, they dabble well. You know, quite though, was like my first introduction into the international African scene. And then from quite though, I was like, oh, it's not, they doing their thing. And then, you know, years later, Black Coffee and his sound. And it's funny, you know, they might call it Afro house or whatever, but I think it's really cultural patterns. So you associate highlight with Nigeria, you know, you associate uh, Afrobeat with Fela, you know, but they all, you know, and I, 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 like I met a, a young lady from the Zulu tribe recently. So they got their own, you know, so that was good. Yeah. Mm. Um, let's have a broader conversation about house music. Um, what's the difference between house and soulful house in your opinion? Mm, as I've been, it's interesting because now the degrees of separation are large. You can see um, like when I when collecting music now, they have all these sub genres. And back in the day, Mono de Bango was house buzz you know and nobody couldn't tell us it wasn't or uh, manual gossip you know e2 e4 classic in the house community nobody could tell you it wasn't you know but now they got it all separated and it feels it feels weird because the house that you typically get in a bundle is more like press button music a soulful house is this element, the sneaky element of appearing live because the singer has a way of like it bringing you into the, the sound. So, you know, that's the difference to me, like, especially when they have these little repeat edits, you know, and sometimes I play it, but it, it really bores me, you know. There's this guy, he got this one track, I repeat myself, I repeat myself, you know, and even Boy used to tell me about that song, Dildo. And I used to be like, they made a song named Dildo? And when I heard it, it was like, Dildo, Dildo, Dildo. I was like, I'm good, you know? So if you tell it, you know, like, that's what I'm saying, house, you can say that's bullshit ass music, you know? Like, I go for it. And I and I'll tell you that after I make the track, you know what I mean. So I'm looking for more jazzy stuff. Although you know, they all have their resonance, you know. And I and I appreciate Afro House a lot. You know, I will say that that particular genre, they have a lot of interesting sounds, you know. Mm. But then you know you got that churchy vibe, and you got to put your foot down on that. If you're not if you're not playing that in New York or Jersey, you ain't going nowhere. So, you know, and as much as you want to be a, a new DJ, you got to give them their 25 because the crowd is like a radio. You know what I mean? They turn on the dial, they want to hear their shit. So you got to give them what they want and give them something new along the way. And that's what a lot of the DJs do. You know, that are good. Um, what, speaking of house uh, in Jersey, what is the Jersey house or the Jersey sound? How would you describe that? A lot of organs, and a lot of singing, King Bo Gannon. And I like that. I like that. I like a lot of praising. You know, sometimes, man, the shout, you go to church, you know, and that's the meme. And he, when he plays that, you already know. You, your, your mind is already on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I get down with that. And although, you know, I may not have a lot of that in my repertoire, 
and it's kind of good because I believe it, you know, it's like this, right? Check. It. There's a lot of music out there. You could sound like another DJ or, you know, have your repertoire like, like this guy, but it's boring that way. You playing his staff. Play your own staff. Maybe you find something different in some other staff. Let that DJ do his thing. Because, you know, like, I, I, I still go out to party. You know, I don't go out to play. Why, you know, even if I was playing, I'd be partying, you know. Because I love the music just as much as, you know, anybody else. You talked about going to the closing party of Body and Soul at um, Club Vinyl. Uh, Two-part question. Part one, what is Body and Soul? Ooh. They have force on their own. I met all three of them dudes. Joe, Joaquin, Danny Privet, Francois. They all legends in their they own right. I can't touch none of that, their pedigree. One day I was in the bank with Joe. He pulled out a knot and I'm working construction. I'll make a good penny. I was none and I wasn't Joe. You know, I wasn't mad at him. I was glad at him. Make that money, bro. Because you see, and this is the thing about them three, especially being from New York. They all shared the grit. They all shared the prize. It wasn't one that was better than the other, one more expensive than the other. See, that's the general politic of this bullshit that goes on with house. Why DJs and certain music don't get played and all of that shit. But then three, especially Joe, bro, you watch him, you'll learn how to DJ. You'll learn how to be contempt, uh, a, a contemporary aficionado for music. Francois is so eclectic, you you never know where he's coming from. I used to hit, hit his parties down at um Cielo, man. On that Monday night sessions, he be throwing that dubstep, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then Danny, Danny with his seven one eight parties, he was ridiculous. Always had a crowd, always had a crowd, beautiful crowd too. You know what I mean? Dancers, dancers all night. Remember that 22nd Street party? Oof. Crazy. Crazy. I had some fun in that club. Tell us about so, the, the closing party of Body and Soul at Bino. What was that like? Oh, man. That was just intense, bro. That was intense. And I think, you know, you won't ever have those feelings again because of the, let me just say this, the youthfulness of the crowd. That's what I keep going back to. We need you. We gonna die one day. You gotta leave it to the youth. To bring that vibration and keep that alive. So yeah, that was that 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 was intense because you know, again, you're trying to dance, right? It's packed in there. And you're gonna get your groove on, but you might get hurt. You might get a kick in the, in the red. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, and nobody means it. You know what I mean? So but it was, it, 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 yeah, it's good. It was good. It was, I mean, it's hard to explain sometimes when you're talking about a party or, because it's about energy that encompasses it from a while back. You said almost like, so it's a combination of emotions, you know, and everybody's kind of letting go and knowing that maybe they won't see this day again, you know. Just like life, you know. How does house music make you feel? Everything. I remember one night I was in shelter. Music was so intense. Timmy just kept playing, bro. After a while, I was just standing there in tears. Tears, bro. Tears. Real hardcore tears. And everybody was kind of looking at me strange because, you know, everybody's getting their groove on and everything. And, and I was kind of like stopped. So, you know, and it wasn't, it was, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't upset about anything. You know, I just, the passion, man. And 
what I really must say about orals is the nonverbal communication. That is explain that. Right. Explain that. Oh, oh, that's magic, bro. You see, when you walking around or you or you in the club, even when you're dancing, people are doing things. They're inspiring each other. One person is dipping and the other person is jumping. And all of these disparate moves are like messing with you. But you see they all coming together like yin and yang. If you could practice this, learning your, magnet, your magnetism in your hands, you would know what I'm talking about. Because once you get this, this chi going, that chi is what is going on in the club. So it's like back and forth, back and forth, in and out, up and down and all around and twists and turns. So all of those things are like, like spirits. No spirits are happy with each other for the most part. And they might not have had a good day. But unlike hip hop, they're not saying they have had a bad day. They tapping it out with their feet. They doing it with their hands and twisting with their bodies and talking. Yo, life was hard. Life is hard. You know, I'm going through some stuff, but you know what? I'm not saying that. I'm saying this. So to say this for me is more important because if you talk about your problems all the time, that's all you are is problems. Here comes problem guy. Here comes problem guy. Come on, problem guy. Over here. So if you try to say, yo, my problems are not my heart, my heart is my heart. And that's what I believe about houses. They wear their heart in that music. That music, that's the shit. That's the church. That's the. So I was like, yo, let me say, yo, you like church? Cool. Let me see how you like church. I'm not the reverend, but. I love it. I love it. What is Club Shelter for those that don't know? Mm, been there since 92. Y'all don't know that. But, uh, oh, oh. Okay. So that's another home. Because, you know, everybody got their little club, right? But when Shelter started, it was like off the cuff because it wasn't too many people going out at that time. Like, you know, club life has its ups and downs. Right? So a lot of the bondage scene was still out. A lot of the, you know, sex clubs and stuff like that was raging in New York. But here comes, in the middle of all of that, here comes this soulful party where people just getting down all night. And they kind of like, at vinyl, they had different energies. So you still had like remnants of that going on in the beginning. And you have the club heads like not really clashing, but you know, like pushing them out. It was almost like a black gentrification of a club. It was weird because you know, you still, still had your little druggies and you know, sexaholics and stuff like that. But here comes these kids that's just like, yo, fuck that music, man. Music all night, ding, 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 you know. So after that. That was like, you know, 92, 93. Now it's going to start gaining popularity. Oh, wow. Club Shelter, yo. Everybody, now you on the horn. We got a new place to go to. So everybody starts coming down there. And then, like, I don't think they ever lost, bro. You cannot lose with that club. Every night. I, I went there so much. They did, a, um, they did their first uh, membership drive. I'll never forget it. Young lady in there. She was like, You want to be a member? I was like, No, I never did a membership and only at Snobbusters. That was my only one. But um, I think about it. I took the invite, the thing home. I never filled it out. And ever since, I never, the girl will always charge me member rate. I am not officially a member of Shelter. I will say that. But I am. I should have been. But yeah, it, 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 and, and even wow. in the sec second drive when they moved to 38th Street and all of that, you know, it's quite interesting. But yeah, man, shelter, shelter is like religion for most. I, I bet you some people got tattoos, you know, I'm definitely, I definitely seen some of them, 
you know. Yeah, that, that, you know. Semi. And boy. That you, well, because, yeah, if you saw the, uh, the feature recently, they honored Temi and Boy, but they was honoring Boy. And um, Temi spoke, like, for the first time on the mic. And, you know, Temi don't talk to nobody. And um, without Boy, it would have been no Temi. And I don't think it would have been Boy without Temi. You know what I mean? They were like one and the same. Two different people, but like shadows of each other. And even I, when it, you know, in my exuberance, you think people are on your level. But what happened to me was, and this is like, I didn't put this in the documentary. It probably should have been the first statement. What? happened to me was I had a tape with both of them on it. I didn't know, but it was one that was like my real, the real. And when I went through some real traumatizing shit when I was a teenager, that tape saved my life. I popped it like three times, but that tape saved my life. And when I realized, cause I knew Timmy registered, but I didn't know Boyd was playing the, the, um, the, um, the solos and stuff. So, when I played, I was like, oh, snap. Oh, this is a piece of history here. And I, I got to get in the booth one day and I was like, yo, man, you saved my life, bro. And he kind of stared at me like, you know, cause he didn't know me, you know what I mean? Like a little defunct, but he knew me cause we would look at each other during the, the sets. You know what I mean? You have that. That's where you get your communication on with the DJ. If you're dancing real hard, like that happened to me at, at studio, which was my first club. And uh, I was there and Larry LeVan mixed three songs. I was like, ooh, ooh. I was standing in the middle of the floor, I just stopped. And I was looking up at him and he was looking at me like, yeah, nigga, I do this. This is what we do here. And I was like, yeah, this is what we do here. And I just went back into the cut. Cause you know, it was just beautiful, man. I mean, that club, Studio 54. So let's it's stop right there. What is what is Studio Fifty Four for people? Oh, that don't, don't say that to me. You know they, they got documentaries. They actually doing a, a piece at the Brooklyn Museum, a retrospective of it, which I probably won't go to. But you know the club was enough for me. But yeah, that was another one. They had the little mini ramp, like the garage. The garage is mad steep, but they, they had the little mini ramp, and when you get in there, you just feel like, oh wow, I just walked into something, and that dance floor is popping. Ooh. Smell like sex all in the place. You know what I mean? Like people get down. Oh yeah. The glass booth DJ shit. You like, oh shit. Ladder. That right there, the ladder was amazing. Was, I remember um, Xavier Gold. You used to hold me. You used to, she used to walk down that ladder like a pro, bro. I was like, oh snap. She's good. She boy, you used to know how to love me, right? She used to do that. Just singing that. He would shut down the music. She would just sing that. Ooh, boy, the crowd would go crazy. Because her, her voice was so clear. Clear. I saw so many acts there. But, you know, Tent City. Like, come on, man. Like, all of them crazy, you know, uh, what was the other one? J.M. Silk. J.M. Silk came to New York. That was hot. That was hot. You know, all the days, man. So, you know, that really incorporates what I like about this shit too. You know, it, you, you can have a good time if you don't overdo it. I used to leave early. That's why I didn't get into the click. People that stayed to the end, that's they would get they. Now they going home together. I had to go to work or go to school or whatever. You know what I mean? So I, I kind of like compartmentalized my club, and, although I loved it. You know, wouldn't overdo it. See, so many people fail that way. Explain that. Fail. We as individuals, we, we we have burdens, right? Then we compile that with drugs, sex, uh, drinking. 
and, and abandonment. You abandon one lifestyle for another. Now, the, the true self knows that you do, you're doing yourself wrong. But the false self is telling you, yo, have a good time, have a good time. And then you burn out. And if I could tell the youth or anybody, man, conserve your energy. Conserve your energy. So you could have some for your children, for your grandchildren, and you could teach them how to house dance, and you could teach them the beauties of art and love and all of that. But if you ain't here and you all whacked out on some drugs or an alcoholic by the time 30, come on, dude. Come on, sis. You know, like, I, I, I ask the youth to be better than us because that's what is expected of the next generation. Be better than, you know? So when, when I seen a lot of wipe out, I caution myself because I don't want to wipe out, bro. Hey, you know what? Okay. This is the real thing about clubbing for me. I love the circle, right? Because people show off. Boy used to say that. Show off, black people. That's what you should do. But you ever notice those dudes? They kind of like a flash in the pan sometimes. They style, but it's only for that brief moment. They can't go all night long. Peace to Brother Lawrence. He used to go all night long. When you can learn how to dance like we dance all night long, use a real pro. You ain't know, oh, I can do a kick and oh, I can do this and break dance and all that. Yeah, that's nice. But can you do it all night long? See, there's a difference, bro. It's like sex. Is it is it love when it's fast? Nah. It, it could be, but you know it's love when it's long and you get in there. You're like, yeah, this is my woman or whoever. You know what I mean? This is my partner. You know what I mean? So I like it. I like I, I like the alarm. You know? But you know, I don't, I don't. You know, because you even seen people that just go to the club to watch. You know, they like a spectator. They go in there, shit, yeah, look at that, look at this. And I be wondering about them. You know, how is it that they, every week in the club, and they, they don't get down? You know, they learning, I guess. You know, But it's, it's all good, and I'm glad that we were in that space together. You know. After Studio 54, what other clubs did you go to? Oh, the World, Palladium, really Palladium first. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What is Palladium uh, for those that don't know? 14th Street is actually the sub. There was the original one, which really broke down the race barriers. And then back in the days, I was in the 50s. That was on 57th Street. And then they subsequently pushed it down to 14th Street. And we, we, when we would come in, that was another hot spot. You know, because that was the other thing. You could see where this was going. All of these theaters are becoming clubs. And these theaters are a show. So Palladium was, they had it underneath. You could go in the catacombs and chill down there. You could come up to the, the first floor and be on the dance floor, then you can go upstairs and be in the little drug dens up there. And, you know, so, and they all had a night, you know, cause you gotta realize the other thing is you think race is a problem now, it was more of a problem then because everything was like, you couldn't go into certain clubs or certain nights cause it'd just be like white night. And you will not wanna be too much around too many white people if you're a black person back then. You know, because they wasn't like all encompassing as it is now with the advent of hip hop or 30 years of hip hop. You know what I mean? So you go in a club now, it's different. Back then, you know, it was a lot of edge to it. You could get in a fight just, just with a stare. You know what I mean? So, like, be honest with you, I ain't really fucked with that place too much, you know, because it was a lot of drugs and shit like that, a lot of predator. 
when we rolled in there on a Friday, we it was like 13 year olds in there and there's some goomba in there selling smack. And like, kids, you gotta be kidding me. You? And you ain't gonna fuck them up because you could get killed, you know? But you mad. I was. I'm looking around, little kids, bro, little kids. And a lot of them, you know, them white people with that shit back then, they would let their kids go to the clubs and say, yeah, I'd be kind of surprised at that, you know what I mean? But they're a little more liberal like that with their kids and shit. We weren't, you know. How old were you when you started going clubbing? I, I had to wait. I was about 17, 16, 17, you know. But there was people that had gone, you know, it was one of the things about a lot of house heads. They would go, yo, my sister got me in the garage when I was 13 and some shit, you know. And you would be like, where are you? Oh, wow, you're using the big boys club, you know? Because you had to be an adult. It wasn't, you know, and you had to have ID, shit. You know what I mean? It wasn't none of that fucking, you know, oh, you just rolling up in here and, and we chilling. No, 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 no. You a little kid, you know what I mean? So that disparity, and you know, it, it, so all of that was involved, you know. But then I would go to, I never went to Wild Pitch, although I heard a lot about it, but I would go to um, the other one after after the world, it's going to be, because after the world, that was a brief too, you know, the world was only open like a, about a year and change. Was well, not, what was the world nightclub? Tell us about that. That one was in the Lower East Side on Avenue A, past Save the Robots. We used to have to walk past Save the Robots to get there. And it was just like a little old hole in the wall at first. And then when you get in, it's this big empty out theater or whatever it was. I think it was a gym or something. And it was crazy. I, the first night I went there, um, Brooklyn Essentials, um, what did they do? Was it Took My Love Away? took my love away and they just got on the stage and they was just all dancing and that was the best because you know usually artists would get up there and try to sing the song or you know no you can't sing you know that verbatim all the time all the, you know you're not going to do that so they got up there and just went crazy with it. i was like oh this is hot this is house and they also had a balcony so you know and then you know from the world because, you know, I was Frankie's house, you know, and he used to tear it up, bro. Tear it up, tear the asshole. Well, he used to walk out of there and we were so young, you know, we didn't care. We didn't have like 10,000 suits of clothes and everything. We'd go out there and it's dripping sweat, bro. Dripping sweat. And sometimes it'd be so cold walking on that side, you'd have to like reheat yourself before you leave because you don't want to go out there and freeze to death. You know, New York was a motherfucker. And, and then it wasn't like the trains was all reliable like it is now, you know. You'd be sitting in that damn station for like a year after the club. You'd be shivering, oh, God, let's go. Or you'd get a coffee or whatever. But, you know, we was just young and, and enjoying life, man, you know. But from the world, then I would go, that, that would be Snobbusters. What's Snobbusters? I never heard of that club. Oh, well. Okay, Snobs was next to this other spot that was, uh, me and my boy was just talking about that. Uh, what was it, House Nation? I think it was House Nation. Mm -hmm. House Nation was on Broadway at Prince, right? Next door was this other club that went upstairs because House Nation was in the basement. And on the second floor of the other building was this little jump off and it was called Snobbusters. And I was like, uh, you know, like the velvet rope crowd, you know what I mean? Like y'all are snobs, so we 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 you know against that, you know. So they 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 formulated this little underground set, and that was the one that I participated with and, and joined up with. And yeah, so then from there, like because all of this is happening really quick too. You gotta understand um there's gonna be a new club. And I'm in, I think I was in Snobs and they was passing out these flyers, construction parties for Sound Factory. I was like, Ooh, what's Sound Factory? That's a fly name, holy shit, what's that? So 
and Ray Ray McKyle could tell you about this too. We were talking about this. Um, that's Lil Ray for people who don't know those the Jamboree and in, in Prospect Park. Quite a magnificent talent as well. Artist, DJ, you know. Thanks to him, I got a lot of good information for the film. He's his his set leads proceeds the film. So in that, there was this these these construction parties and that one that I went to was, I think it was, I forget if it was David Morales. Larry ended up there and Frankie was there. And it was like on this, we was upstairs in this like studio, but there was the whole floor. And then they had the little upstairs that went up to the top. You could go outside and just mill around. It was a small crowd though, maybe 200 people, you know what I mean? But this big floor and the music was just blasting and you know, all of the hits that they was playing back then. But um, yeah, that's that those that would become Sound Factory on 27th Street. After that, then the next one was the one down the block from me. But there were so many clubs to go to, you know. Um, I'm thinking of the name of it because you know you think of all of these names. But the one, the tunnel, the tunnel, you know that was that was very famous for a lot of people. You know, it was made out of an old. Uh, I think a rail factory or something like that. They used to have, they used to have rails in there. You know, it's crazy shit. And that club was smack, smack every night. Mines, mines galore, girls galore, anything, drugs galore, everybody. And first, the house set really set that area off because there was nobody over there. It was old abandoned industrial buildings and some still operating printing buildings and stuff like that. But they took over the first floors and that brought that whole community. Now you can't even get an apartment over there. Nothing, own a building, nothing. But um, yeah, they had also, there was a club in that, um, you, you, you ever seen that building down there on, I think it's 27th and 11th? And it has the car sticking out. There's a building there that has cars, half a car. Oh, yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I know exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was, they did the, Robert Owens did a set there. Bro, amazing. I was just talking about that. That That's when I met Casey Flight's dancing. Casey Flight, uh, oh, man, it was his song. You know, you know his stuff. That was hip house. But um, he was, you know, his dances was, Amazing, beautiful too, gorgeous, gorgeous. So I, I went in there and met them and they friend. That was one of the first nights that I ever had like a, a disco soiree night where I was like Casanova Brown coming in the crew and I was just swinging around like this, doing all this, jumping around. I was like, I never danced like that with anybody else. You know, usually this house, you know, getting at you, you know what I mean? But now this one, she was just like, like a fairy. She was so light. She would just come right to me. I was like, yeah, that was really nice. But Robert Owens, great DJ, great artist, great everything. That 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 was a beautiful night. But that club too. That was a that, but you know, they was one offs. And then they would die out because people would stop going out and people got jobs, right? You gotta have a job. Um, what is Soul Summit? Fort Green Park for people that don't know. That's a collective of brothers that have done some phenomenal work in Brooklyn. I mean, you know, it's all different energies that come together to make things happen. And I'm proud of them, you know. Secretly, I think they hate me. They never give me no love, man. They kind of hard to deal with, but it is what it is, bro. They do the damn thing. They brought the crowd up to the top of the hill. And that's all you gotta do is point the light. So I give them their props, you know? 
I'm not I'm not here to bash anybody, bro. Especially as you get older, you're gonna learn that if you bashing anybody, you should bash yourself so that you could do better. If they not doing good and you mess it the obvious, what good are you? Do better for yourself. So, and they taught me that in that virtual room. You know what I mean? Like, if you if you think about yourself, you can learn from people that you may not like or may not have a good rapport with. It's just about learning, though. And I, you know, so summit, give them mad props. I wish they had a, a more of a radio presence. They should be on BLS, uh, you know, uh, have a feature show. You know, where, you know, they bring it, bring the heat from Brooklyn. You know, I think that's the other politicized factor about house that I will talk about is that it's not treated well on the radio in New York. It's like, you know, they diss it. House is gay. And I got love for many gay people. I'm not saying is house is house. How about that? That's it. Well said. What is the clubhouse jamboree? That guy. Lil Ray, man. Been, I, I remember when I first seen Lil Ray in the club, I was like, look at this little dude go. Flipping, bouncing around, cartwheeling. Having fun, big old smile on his face. Gotta enjoy him. So over the years, he paid homage to the scene by giving a free event with good food. Sometimes it'd be all right. But he got that together too. You know, everybody goes to the learning stage. But you know, like just the fact that he did it. And for all of these years, it's almost like 30 years now. Can't even believe that, you know, I was like, like at the, some of the first, and yo, I used to live over there, right? So one day I was walking in the park and I'm like, yo, I hear house music. How the fuck do I hear house music in the park? I bumped into this shit. I was like, this dude, I looked up on this thing, it's Lil Ray up there. I'm like, what? I was so surprised. I was, and, 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 and it was like, a plus because I wasn't in the clique. You know, I wasn't getting the phone calls and I wasn't on the guest list and all of that shit. You know, I was known, but you know, like like KRS once said, many people know me, but I'm known by a few, you know. So real talk, you know, I really appreciate the Jamboree. It's another, it's it's actually it's pre-Fort Green. And you would say it's little Fort Green because Fort Green is downtown and it attracts so many people. So many people could come through Manhattan and Staten Island and other places in Jersey, easier to Fort Green. You know, Prospect Park is in the, is in the dip, you know, especially the way he throws it. You know, you, you'd be hard pressed to find it if you didn't know about Prospect Park. You know? But I'm glad he does it and, you know, he, uh, let's say this, his love for humanity taught me how to be an open, a more open individual. I was a little close-minded when I came to the house. I had to let, let a lot of things go and know that they, their life is not my life, but we share these lives together. So that's why, you know, people like Carlos Sanchez, another profound instrument in this sound, you know, like, if you don't say his name, you can't say the story about house music. You know, just to say his name, not, you don't gotta say what he did or who he is, and just to say his name. You know, God bless you, Carlos. You know. 
those are the questions that I had. Is there anything else you want to talk about about house music or about your film? Nah, man. You know, I, I, it was so interesting because it's like a song. I could feel when the end was coming. I mean, just when that, I, I felt like that was the end of our conversation. You know, and I'm I'm very thankful and grateful that you gave me this opportunity to express myself in this way. You know, I mean, there are always expressions. I, I, I like to do it non-verbally a lot, but I do, I get the conversation on, you know, it's all good. Thank you very much, man. That's, that's really what I have to say. No, and thank I you. I appreciate you for putting out this film uh, as a conversation that needs to be had. You captured moments in time that are never to be replicated. Um, one final question. Um, what happened, well, two part question, what happened to New York nightlife and what effect will COVID have on nightlife going forward? Ooh. I mean, you know, it's weird, it's still alive. A lot of people think that these things die. You know, that's what they'll say about house. So what happened to house? And then you'll go somewhere and you'll hear it blaring. I hear it in Eastern Europe, bro. I, I think New York life, life will never go anywhere. It, it will change. And of course it will look different in the age of COVID. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I would hope that people could muster the energy that they have in the club, in their homes. Because I'm gonna show that. you. Explain uh, that. I'm gonna show you this. And anybody that's listening that ever went to a club or any event, you can attest to this. When you go out, you're trying to show off in front of people. So your energy is gonna be more. When you're home, there's nobody there to show off to. So your energy, you got, you got, it's a whole different energy. You got to muster up a whole lot of energy to feel like you in the club. Or is that so? Can you reproduce that same energy alone and have the cosmic air take it to the next level? I'm, I, 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 because you know, you see these virtual parties and people have fun, but people aren't getting down. They're not getting down. They just, yeah, I like this too. Toon. They don't even say that. Toon. Nah, he was getting down when he was flipping on the ground and nothing else mattered. Or when you did that spin and everybody saw it. So, I mean, you know, I try to keep that energy with me. That's, that's what I say about me. I don't really need the club to feel that energy. I brought my energy to the club. I'm taking my energy with me. I didn't need the club to, to, to bring forth my energy. Mm. And, you know, so when you say about, because see, you know what? What people don't realize about nightlife, we work in the witching hour. We time the party get popping, three o'clock in the morning. The loft wasn't shit at 11 p.m. That none of them was good at 10 o'clock. Nine o'clock, you wouldn't even go to the door. But go there at 4 a.m., go there at 5 a.m. Remember when, remember when the first, I remember when the first after hours was opening at like at 6 a.m. Which one was that? Club Celtic. Nigga was open at 6 a.m. Oh shit, church. So come on, like real talk, it'll never stop. People, people, we will die, but New York life, like won't die. Can I say that again? We will die, but New York life, life will not die. Believe that, it's here to stay. In my estimation, it'll always be here. So yeah, the house community needs 
just need to keep going on. Because we're going to be here. No. Thank you again, bro. Thank you. That was a perfect Thank way to so end. Much. That was perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I'll be. I'll keep in touch with you. I'll let you know what's going yeah. on, man. Definitely. Yeah. You know. Yo. Right, blessings always, man. Enjoy the evening, man. You too. Peace. All right. Peace. peace.